Hello everyone, I'm Sam. Uh, I'm not Emma. Um, thank you for having me. I found out about this talk yesterday, so hopefully it will be inspiring and delightful. But if not, feedback is great. Put it on the retro board. Um, but I'm actually going to talk to you about developer communities today. So unfortunately, it's no longer enough to just be a great developer. You need to be speaking at conferences, blogging, committing to open source, engaging with the community, and the list goes on. And you're probably wondering why. Why is my technical ability not enough? Well, the quick answer is a lot of the times people making decisions about your career actually don't see your code, but they should be seeing and hearing your name. Funny enough, you actually don't need to be a very good developer, no, I'm joking, if people know your name, but you'll start to realize that growing your brand can really help you get there. So, as I said, I'm Sam, I'm a community manager at Sneak, which means I hopefully help people adopt security into their software development life cycles. I also look after a community called DevSecCon, which is a global community, kind of taking the lovely sharing mindset of you wonderful humans in DevOps and bringing security into the fold. If that's something that actually interests you, we do have an event on the 27th of September in the evening in Hoxton. Come along, it should be lots of fun, you can see me. If you can't come, we also live stream all our events all across the world. So if you like something in our Rio community or our San Francisco community, you can actually watch it as it's happening. Um, but that's enough about that. If you want to find out more about me, you can stalk me on LinkedIn. You can follow me on Twitter or X, whatever it's called, or I'm on the DevSecOps community Discord. I do have a bit of a disclaimer, though, before I get started. I'm going to speak about a lot of things today. You don't have to do all of them. Pick one thing that actually interests you and go from there. So what will I speak about? When we speak about public speaking, call for papers. We have one open now, so maybe this will inspire you to submit. Blogging, community engagement, open source communities, and then also how do we maybe find our next role through community? But you might be looking at this list and saying, Sam, that's great. I love what I do for a living, but I don't want to be the next big conference speaker or a Twitter fanboy or whatever we're calling it. There's always other ways to get involved. So when we're looking for promotions, whether it's going from you know, sort of IC role up to a principal or we want to become a director, some of the times when you go in for that promotion, our managers tell us we don't have the skills demonstrated to get that role. But if you don't get the opportunity to show off those skills in your day job, you might never get that promotion. So let me give an example. If I want to become more senior, maybe one of the things I need to demonstrate is the ability to explain complex problems to a big audience. Now, if I've never been about to speak at a company update or your R&D monthly, or whichever meetings you have, you're never going to get the opportunity to show that you can actually do it. But engaging in community, maybe giving a talk like this, will allow you to showcase to your manager that you have those skills even though you might not do them at work. And I'm going to cover a lot of this during the talk. So think about it in terms of two minds, in terms of obviously growing your brand within the community space, but also how can I show, gain skills through the community that will help help, hopefully help me progress in my career. But with that, let's move on. So, public speaking. Now, if the idea of standing in front of 10, 50, 100 people literally gives you a panic attack, you do not need to do it. But a lot of the time I hear, Sam, what am I actually going to talk about? I have nothing to say. Or, I'm not an expert. Others know more than me. Well, this is something we can actually deal with. So, what to talk about? Well, you all solve problems every single day. You go on to Stack Overflow, Google, some guy's blog, GitHub, and eventually you solve the problem and you think, if only I knew now, then what I know now. Well, chances are your problem isn't actually that unique and other people are feeling the same way. You've done half the work in solving the problem. Use that as your next conference talk. Other things you can talk about is, do you have a great team dynamic? What can't you solve? A lot of the times we think we need to have a solved solution before we talk on stage. If you give me five reasons why you tried something and it failed, you help someone else not make those five same mistakes. Maybe someone in the audience has solved that problem and afterwards they come and actually help you solve it. Or maybe you inspire them to give a talk. Or maybe you come back the following year and now you go, right, I made those five problems. They did not work. And here is my solution. So you don't always have to think about, I've now solved the problem, now I can only go share that with the community. Think about what experiences you have that are unique and interesting and share them. If you're not an expert, chances are you're not the most you know, sort of intelligent person all the time, and that is completely fine. But if I use the analogy of, let's say I'm an early stage founder, 
And it might be interesting to hear uh, Google or Oracle or whoever made their first billion, but I'm a couple months into the role and all I want to know is how to survive the first year without going bankrupt. The problem is, is that we're all on different parts of our journey and we're always looking at the people above us in the mountain. If only I was intelligent as them, if only I knew what they knew. And we forget to realize that there are people climbing up the mountain who are behind you who actually think that about you. So know that you don't need to be the expert, the subject matter expert. There are people that will learn from what you have to sell and you'll learn from others as to what they have to say. But I would say the biggest thing is to get feedback. Now you spend a lot of time putting together conference talks. They say it takes about 45 minutes per slide. That is a lot of time. You can submit that talk to many different conferences. This is not the first time I've given this session, but I always want to improve it. But if any of you have ever asked for feedback, most people are lovely human beings and we love to give positive feedback. So invite someone to your conference session with the idea of giving you, giving you feedback. Say, please come, I know it's gonna be great, generally speaking, you know, but I'd like to actually have tangible feedback, please listen with that. But think about who you're inviting. So if my talk is aimed at junior developers, while it might be nice to have my head of technology or CTO in the room, they haven't been a junior developer in a very long time. So their feedback might not be as relevant. So just think about that. I wanted feedback on the way I gave presentations when I first started. So I didn't actually have to invite someone who knew the content of my talk. I invited someone who I thought was really great on stage. And I was really nervous because I am not technical, even though I always speak to technical audiences. And so my first talk, I constantly fidgeted with my clothes. So I got that feedback. Now I don't go home and go, well now I'm terrible, I fidgeted with my clothes, I look like a child, I'm never gonna do it again. I then went and asked people, well, how do I fix that? And someone gave me the idea of holding something in my hand. So now I have a clicker, and so that's what I fidget with. If I didn't have a clicker, I might hold a pen in my hand, a water bottle, and so I can improve. So take the feedback on, but don't think that's the end of the world. You can then um, figure out how we solve those problems. If you say, you know what, conferences, not for me, no thank you. That's okay too. You don't have to grow your sort of public speaking experience standing on stage. But you all solve problems every day. Why not book a meeting room or a Zoom or whatever and share it with your team? It's another way of demonstrating to your manager that you can guide people, mentor people, share your experiences. Um, you may then get inspired to maybe talk at a meetup or a community event and maybe hopefully submit to a CFP later this year. But again, don't think that the only way to practice your public speaking skills is to stand on a big stage. There's loads of different ways to get involved. Now, I've used the word CFP a lot. For those of you in the room who don't know what a CFP is, that is completely fine. All it means is call for papers. So the beautiful thing about our industry is conferences aren't a bunch of people sitting behind a closed door going invite only, let's invite the next big speaker. They actually need you to submit to keep up to date with what's going on in the industry. So they would like to hear from you. It also helps them to attract a diverse speaker audience. And I'm not only speaking about diversity of race or gender, but also diversity of thought. So know that you can submit different things. I'm speaking about community at a technical conference. Sometimes we can submit things that are interesting to the space that might not be exactly in line with. So please submit, submit, submit. But how do we write a CFP? Now I would say titles are very important. A CFP committee will look at your full submission, don't get me wrong, but a catchy title can really take you a long way to potentially get to the top of that pile. But there's a few do's and don'ts. So in terms, obviously, a catchy title always goes down well. Please make it short, 80 to 100 characters max. Don't need to know your whole talk in your title. You can use humor, but the right humor, please. And numbering actually goes a long way. Five tips in five minutes on five JVM languages, I'm just making up stuff now. But that does go down well because I know exactly what you're going to be speaking about. But do not use sexual references, inappropriate language. We don't want to be called rock stars or ninjas or pirates anymore. If you're unsure, I mean a funny title does go down well, but maybe sanity check it with someone and maybe sanity check it with someone that doesn't look like you. Because we are surrounded with people that share the same humor as us. So let's ask again a diverse audience is this actually funny? Do you actually get what I'm trying to say? When it comes to actually writing your abstracts, this is where I get really, really scared. I'm dyslexic and I hate writing. So again, I'll give you a very quick do's and don'ts. 
Obviously, keep it short. We don't need rambling, long um, submissions. What is the audience going to get out of this? What's in it for them? If I come to your talk, what will I learn? And again, don't forget, you can use bullet points, so you can do a very quick overview, and these are the things I'm going to get out of it. But please, no long messages. If I can read your abstract, and I don't actually have to come to your talk, then you've given me too much information. Just what are the highlights? Also, it means then that when you're writing your talk later on, you haven't committed to too much and you can change it. But no, um, you don't need to write the whole thing out short and to the point. If you're unsure, talk to your friends, your colleagues, ask them to review it. Even if they built the project with you, you know, if they saw your talk and your abstract six months ago before you solved the issue, would they have wanted to come to your talk? So ask around. We want to help each other. People love to help people. And people love to give their opinions. So ask. It's OK. But again, please do not submit product pictures or sales pictures. I'm sure you know when you go to a conference, the last thing you want to do is hear a pitch, so don't do it. Sometimes, though, our companies pay for us to travel, and they would like their brand up there. I did it today. I mentioned I was from Sneak, stand for approval. You've now heard the name Sneak. We have a booth downstairs. Come say hi. But there are other times where maybe I have a software as a service or something like that, and I want you to know about it. There are ways to do this strategically that doesn't mean you give a pitch. So I'll give you an example. Sneak as a service, we have developer relations, and they get paid to travel all around the world. Now, they need to submit just like everyone else, but they, in order for our company to pay for them to travel, they need to be obviously talking about what Sneak does. But what they'll do is they will never give a demo, but if they're talking about something, let's for argument's sake, how to manage vulnerabilities, they're not going to use a competitor tool when they show what they're doing, so they're going to work in that environment. So there's ways of showing off your brand without necessarily giving a pitch and being useful, helpful, and educational. So just think about that. And when you're speaking to your manager about it, you can explain it in the same way. Right. You might also think, Sam, I don't want to give a 30-minute long talk. That's OK, too. All conferences on their website will have their different types of talks. Um, and what's involved in those. I'm not going to go through all of them today. Most of them are self-explanatory, conference sessions, workshops, things like that. But I will tell you about a few that I find quite interesting. So if you've ever heard or seen the word boff, birds of a feather, these are actually love. So they're usually about one hour long. There will be experts in the room that are invited to kind of lead the discussion around something. But it is open audience participation. So you then don't have to submit a CFP. But you can go along and either ask or answer a question and start to practice flexing those muscles of speaking out loud in front of people. So boffs are great. The other one is obviously panels. Now, we've all heard about what a panel is. But the reason why I love panels is I don't actually have to be the expert. I'm asking the questions. But I can invite the experts to share the stage with me. You also might find that because you're interested in this problem space, you start to give your own opinions as well. And again, it gets you a little bit more comfortable in speaking on stage that when hopefully you submit that talk, it feels um, less daunting and scary. I've been doing public speaking for a while, and I still get nervous. I was nervous earlier. Um, you can speak to probably anyone who stands on stage. As comfortable as they look, they are just as nervous as you. So don't worry too much about that. I know you say, don't worry. But and the last one is Quickie Ignites Lightning Talks. They have a lot of different names. Uh, they're usually between 5 to 20 minutes. We've got some later today. Check them out before lunch. But again, these are quick fire. Now, this can either help you practice your public speaking, or maybe you just want to share this one little nugget. You're like, Sam, I don't want to do 30 minutes of rambling on about something. I've got this cool thing to share. I want to say it succinctly, and I want to get off stage. Great things to submit to. So you don't only have to think about these early on in your speaking career. Constantly, you know, you can try different things and maybe then take four quickies you did over the year and turn it into one longer talk later on. Right, but again, please never give up. Conference speaking is hard and you will get rejected. I get rejected all the time. It doesn't mean that your talk was terrible, that no one wants to hear it. Number one, we get more submissions than we have spots for, con for speakers. So you will get turned down. Number two, if you're speaking about a hot topic, chances are a lot of people have submitted a similar talk. And conference or CFP committees have to make the hard choice of choosing someone else over you or vice versa. So know that it is OK to keep submitting. But again, you want to ask for feedback. Either reach out to the CFP committee and find out maybe why you weren't accepted so you can make tweaks. I see this with DevSecCon all the time. We get amazing submissions. 
but actually they fail to tell us what the audience will get out of it, and it's a bit unclear, and so we end up accepting someone else. But we'll give that feedback back. If you don't hear from the CFP committee, they're not obligated to give you feedback, and most of the time they're doing it in their personal time, reach out to a local meetup group, ask a friend, have them look at things, and then you can slowly start to tweak and adapt your sessions. Um, but I would also say that it takes a lot of time to write a conference talk. As I said, 45 minutes per slide. We should be thinking of ways we can make this content uh, help us in other ways. Also, people learn in different ways. So as I said, I'm dyslexic, so I learn a lot audially. I love to listen to podcasts. Other people might love to read because they can skim read, so blogging, they always go to blogs. Watching, obviously, conference talks, videos, things like that. Now, I call this content recycling. We want to, if we're going to spend all that time putting together a conference talk or a blog, how do we take that information and make it accessible for everyone? Again, you might be like me, very nervous about speaking because you're dyslexic, or English isn't your first language, and that's also scary. So what I do is, that's not what I was going to say, that's also scary. Um, there are tools out there that can help you along the way. So if you haven't heard of Grammarly, download it tomorrow. It's amazing. There's also like tools like you can pay someone a fiver to check your spelling and your grammar. And now we have AI. It's changed my life. I write some stuff. I give it to ChatGPT. I may say make this sound interesting. And it comes back. It's my thoughts. You know, I'm not getting it to create my content. I'm just getting it to help me with the things that I'm nervous about. So know that you can use different tools. But again, if I talk about recycling, 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 when I write my talk, I actually kind of word vomit all the words down on the dock. And I'm like, what do I want to say? And then from there, I create my slides. I can use that information to write the blog post. You spend a lot of time researching problems. Why not take that information, turn it into a talk, a podcast episode? Again, you don't have to start a podcast tomorrow or a video series. There's loads of people out there doing that. So reach out to them. Hey, I'd love to share this on your podcast or your video series or speak at your conference. You don't need to do it all, but make sure that the work that you're doing is working for you. You shouldn't be reinventing the wheel all the time. And this actually brings me to community. So a community is a great place to grow your personal brand and help each other out. Also, again, as I said, you spend a lot of time solving problems and you might actually see people asking similar questions you're trying to solve. We then eventually find the solution, and we go off on our merry little way, and we forget to go back to the poor people on the interweb to help them solve the problem. So why not take the information that you've learned and go back and answer other people's problems? Now, you might be saying, but Sam, I actually got the solution from Hannah, and I would hate to steal Hannah's ideas. Credit Hannah for the great work she did, but maybe the way that you explained it helps the next person actually solve that problem. We all explain things in different ways, we always write in different ways, and the way your brain works might be the solution that person needed when trying to solve that problem. So know that your ideas are actually really important and you should get involved in the community. And again, that allows you to exercise those skills of you know, mentorship, of writing, of getting involved in the community. I would also say that don't only look at the people standing on stage or the ones with the biggest names and think those are the only people you can learn from. Every single human in this room has something to share, is working on some cool things, has solved some cool problems. So back to the Pac-Man, let someone in. Don't only let them in just because it's nice so that they're not standing all on their own. Let them in because you may have something to learn from them and they may have something to learn from you. So we can also share things in the community without having to write or speak on stage, but just having a chat. The other thing is, is that we know that technology is fast moving. And if we're waiting for a book to be published or some university degree to be put out there, chances are we're already behind the times. The people writing those books and putting together their content are at community events, sharing that knowledge, getting that research. So you can be, stay ahead, of technology just by engaging with the people in this room and the rest of the community. So please look at each other. You're all thought leaders in this space and you all have something to share. Right, open source. So we use this word a lot. Um, and you know, why should we get involved in open source? Well, I think there's loads of different reasons, but I suppose the biggest thing is, is we can learn, we can teach, and we can gain a lot of skills by engaging in the open source community. But the biggest reason why people get involved is to actually improve the software we rely on every 
day. But what does it actually mean to contribute? So it's quite a daunting space, especially if you're new to committing to open source. You might be thinking, but how do I find a project? What if something goes wrong? What if I can't code? There's loads of support out there, and I'll give you a few tips today on how to get involved, but know that there is a number of different ways to contribute to open source, and the best, biggest misconception is that you do not have to always contribute code. Now, you're actually probably doing a open source maintainer a lot of help by looking at other parts of the project that aren't just submitting new features, and I'll give you some examples of this. So let's say you enjoy planning events. Well, putting together a workshop or a hackathon or a meetup about a certain open source project can really help that community grow. You might enjoy, to design, enjoy, uh, enjoy design, so why not look at the usability and help them tweak things that way? If you like to write, documentation is always out of date or non-existent, so you will really help people with documentation. Obviously, organizing, look at any tickets, group them together, help them structure what's going on within their project. Obviously, if you do like coding, you can write new features. If you like to help other people, jumping onto Stack Overflow, Reddit, wherever it may be, answering questions is very helpful. And if you like uh, helping others to code, you can do code reviews, you can write tutorials on how to use that open source pa package. Uh, but know that there are loads of ways to get involved and loads of ways to build other skills. So you may love coding, but you think, you know what, Sam, I am terrible at explaining things. Well, let's start to put together some events or help people online to start flexing that muscle so that we can learn how to do that within the community so when we're up for that promotion or that role, we then have those skills and we've practiced. So no, you can use the, not use, you can work with the open source community in a way that is mutually beneficial for all parties. Right, so now we know why we should or how we should contribute. How do we find what to contribute to? There are lots of open source things out there. It's actually the London Java community have a cool program called Meet a Project or something, and they actually do round tables on meeting open source maintainers, so you can just actually chat with them directly on what they're working on uh, and potentially get involved in that way. But there's loads of things out, out there. But I would say most of the people who will come back and continue to contribute to something is looking at what projects they already use. So if you're using something and you find a bug, Rather than patching it and moving on, why not submit that back? One, you're helping the community. Two, you're helping your friends, your colleagues who also use um, that uh, tool to then um, have a nicer tool. So you can submit that back. If you see a broken link, let them know. If you see spelling mistakes in the documentation, get involved in things that you already are involved in because you will keep going back to it because it helps you with what you're building. It doesn't also always have to be in your work environment. You might be hacking on something in a personal project, but again, you're more likely to continue to contribute to something that actually affects your life day to day. So whilst it's nice to get involved in all the open source projects in all of the world, um, Charity starts at home. Um, cool. Uh, also remember that open source community isn't a elite club. You don't have to be some certain type of person to get involved. I think open source is just a fancy term of treating the world's problems as fixable. So let's fix them together. But again, as you know, I love to recycle. So if I am working with an open source project, if I've contrib contributed in any way, how can I take what I've learned? I've done all that work and maybe turn it into that next conference talk or that blog post or go onto someone's podcast or whatever it may be. But you've done most of the work anyway. You do not need to reinvent the wheel and find something new and shiny to talk about. Take that information and let it go further. The last thing I want to actually talk about is finding work within communities. So obviously, we're in a very unsettling economic climate at the moment, and some people have lost roles, or maybe they're a little bit nervous to move because, you know, the world is a crazy place at the moment. Well, the community is actually an amazing way to find work. How many people in this room have ever been a hiring manager or are a hiring manager at some point? How many of you liked looking at CVs? Ah, oh, we have one. <laughs> How many of you would love to hire someone that you knew was amazing for the job, but never had to look at their CV? So the community can help you do that. 
We meet people every day and we can talk about the things that we're passionate about, work on projects together, and chances are when that hiring manager is actually looking for someone, they will turn to you and go, hey, actually we're doing this cool container thing. You mentioned at the last event you were building something a little bit similar. Do you want to come in and interview? Now that relationship is not going to get, just get you the job. You still got to show that you can do the work. You know, I'd like to say I can blag myself into any role, but I can't. But you want to get yourself on top of the, the CV pile. You want to be um, the first person they think of. Again, if they don't turn to you, that's completely fine. You can ask people if they're looking to hire. Please don't be scared. I know it's an awkward thing. Asking someone if they have a job is just as bad as asking to lend money from a family member. But companies actually give their employees bonuses for referrals because they don't want to pay recruitment agents. So you can actually make each other a little bit of money by finding that role. Go look on the website, obviously, figure out if they're hiring for someone in your space. But the worst they can say is no. So why not just ask? The other thing that community is absolutely amazing with is how many people in this room have ever gone through an interview process and they sell you the dream. And they're working on the latest technology, everyone's lovely, it's amazing, and then you start on your first day and you're like, is this the same company? This is not what I signed up for. Well, the community, being part of the community, you can actually find out what it's actually like to work at a company before you even go through the process. The one thing I would say is don't only listen to their body language, but listen to the words that they're saying. If someone is going on a rant about why their company is absolutely terrible, or going, oh my god, my company is the best thing, don't only get excited with them or angry with them, but hear the words that are saying, because kind of that whole thing of one man's rubbish is another man's treasure, that analogy, I might be saying these things of why I don't like working for my company, but that might actually really interest you. You're like, I want to solve that problem, or vice versa. My company is amazing. Every Wednesday, everyone comes into the office and does free yoga. I couldn't think of anything worse than doing yoga with my colleagues. That is not the company for me. So just listen to the words they're saying as well, not just, oh, my company is the worst. But I would say, in short, the people, as I said in the beginning, that are making decisions about your career don't always see your code or the work that you're doing, but they should be hearing and seeing your name. That way we can grow, we can roll, we can do different things. I personally haven't applied for a role in about 15 years. I wouldn't say I'm the best person at the job I do. I'm pretty cool, but I'm not amazing. But it's because of the relations I've made within the community that I can have these frank conversations, I can talk about their challenges and hopefully find that role. Now again, you do not have to do it all. You've done half the work already just doing your day job. Just take it one step further and share it with the community. It will help them and it will help you regardless of whether you want to be the next big person on stage or just get that promotion or move on to that new role. And again, as I say, it can be in an IC role or managing people. This is not just about learning to public speak so we can have a team of 500 underneath us because that is also my worst nightmare. Uh, principle all the way, not managing people. I love people, I just don't think I'm a very good manager. But anyways, you can utilize it in different ways. But I hope that was useful. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you all go off and maybe submit for next year's event or get involved in a meetup or community. Oh, I'll see you on the 27th in Hoxton for a great event. But I'm Sam.